My mom, who died when I was 18, taught me everything I know. She was a poet and a yoga teacher, a lover of arts and a promoter of peace. I grew up in a beautiful bubble full of artists, gay people, and the kind of creative and curious joy generally reserved for psychedelic trips. We lived in Berkeley, California. As a kid, my favorite hobbies were climbing trees and doing magic tricks. But by the time I was 17, still a tree climber, a magician, and perhaps unsurprisingly, a virgin, <laughs> I applied to join the military. <laughs> my mom was horrified. Where had she gone wrong? <laughs> this really was my mom's fault, indirectly. In 1999, she had plopped me down in front of the television and said, we need to watch this show together. You're going to love it. I was six. The show was The West Wing. I don't know exactly what I'd done leading up to kindergarten that made my mom believe this liberal-leaning political drama was a must-watch for me, but it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I'd showed an interest already in public service, then this cemented it. And if I hadn't, then this created it. I grew up wanting to serve my country. The West Wing had turned my mom's artistic, activist, Dorco daughter into an American patriot, goddammit. <laughs> my mom was a proud American. She just also believed the highest form of patriotism included a healthy dose of skepticism, criticism, and outright dismantling of a country's systems. That included a distrust for the military-industrial complex. <laughs> In 1967, she was seven and dressed up for Halloween as a peace sign, and the other kids threw eggs at her. She probably would have been a conscientious objector. As I applied to colleges, I didn't know yet what I wanted to do with my life. I got straight A's, was the captain of my sports teams, stage managed the musicals, was the president of my class, the president of Model Congress, and also ate lunch most days with my math teacher. <laughs> when I had free time, I practiced magic tricks in the mirror and read Harry Potter. <laughs> Basically, somehow, the Navy had said the magic words. Teamwork, leadership, service, and free college. <laughs> and though it wouldn't be on a Nimbus 2000, the Navy could teach me to fly. <laughs> My mom worried the Navy would change me for the worse, but she believed I could change the Navy for the better. She was mostly worried it would squash my creativity, that I'd have to give up my silliness when I donned the uniform. At least, she thought hopefully the Navy might get me to make my own bed. <laughs> Two weeks before my mom died of cancer, she watched proudly as I sworn in as a midshipman, phase one complete of my status as a progressive sleeper agent. <laughs> ROTC was not so bad, certainly not worse than my mom dying, but it could have been worse. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed my first semester in college at the same time that I started kissing women. <laughs> and ROTC only took up my mornings. The rest of the time, I lived in an academic ivory tower, surrounded by eager students, its own beautiful bubble of progressive thinking and inclusivity based in the heart of the city of brotherly love. But when I graduated college and was commissioned as an officer, I had to move to the panhandle of Florida for flight school. The Bay Area and my bachelor's degree were disappearing in the rear view. I left behind my beautiful bubbles and moved to a town just across the border from Alabama. I lived on a swamp. In aviation, only 7% of us are women. 93% are men. And these guys, they are all taught. <laughs> They are the worst, <laughs> even the best of them. 
I mean, a lot of these men are white, often conservative, almost all of them are hetero, and all of them are tools. <laughs> Even the lovable ones. You've seen Top Gun, right? <laughs> to be clear, I did know shitty straight white men before I joined the military. <laughs> After all, almost immediately after my birth, I met my dad. <laughs> While my mom battled three rounds of cancer, my dad tried to bleed her dry financially, dragging her to court over and over again to fight for custody of kids who were afraid of him and his explosive anger. By the time I went to college, I had a thick skin when it came to emotionally abusive men who had never done the work. Still, being a vocal, queer, female, Jewish magician. <laughs> made me an easy target for ridicule by my new coworkers. My second night living in Florida, I went out drinking with some of my new colleagues. I was probably the only woman in the group. The rest were male, freshly minted military officers with buzz cuts. When I mentioned to one of them why I joined the Navy, I said something about the badass job opportunities for women. Another guy had heard me from across the room and barked, I bet you voted for Obama too, didn't ya? It was like a record scratch. Obama? My skin felt hot and prickly. I didn't know what to say. I thought what I'd said was innocuous. Was it blasphemous for me to have said something about opportunities for women? That wasn't something polarizing, was it? <laughs> of course, I knew I'd voted for Obama. <laughs> I'd worked on his campaign. <laughs> Obama's 2008 election was part of why I felt excited to join the military in the first place. But I couldn't risk saying so. I told them that as a member of the armed forces, I was technically nonpartisan and I didn't share my voting record anyway. They saw right through me. <laughs> you did, didn't you? Said a tool from Huntington Beach. He could tell a confrontation was brewing and it seemed to agitate him in all the right ways. He was buzzing. I refused to answer, but they could tell they'd made me nervous. I had made myself a permanent target. Fast forward, and any time I drank with my colleagues, the night would inevitably culminate in them ganging up on me, trying to bait me to talk politics. If I talked about a lack of equity and how socioeconomic disparities were correlated with race, their eyes lit up. It was like a game. They seemed giddy when I suggested that we were still seeing the effects of slavery. It was as if I had fallen into their trap, as if they had a bet that I'd bring that up, as if it were a t classic talking point and nothing more. I hardly knew anyone in Florida then, so by default, these guys were my community. One of them was right out of a Tom Petty song, a good boy who loved his mama. Love Jesus, and America too. <laughs> he didn't believe gay people really existed. His name was Austin, but he was from Florida. <laughs> he was one of my new de facto friends. One time I was talking to Austin and another pilot, Willie, who was from Texas, about sex. I asked them how often they went down on the women they were dating. <laughs> and then I shamed them for their answers. <laughs> they asked if I had ever done such a deed. I answered in the affirmative. Willie admitted that he and Austin had suspected as much. I said, yeah, well, I, I identify as queer. Austin scoffed. What? 
queer? No, Julie, you just experimented in college. <laughs> it eased all the guys' minds that I was dating Andrew. I'd known Andrew since college, and to me, he was silly, sweet, and creative. A theater kid who loved trees, raised by a single mom. But to Austin, <laughs> but to Austin and the others, Andrew was a white hetero guy in flight school with us who was good at sports and liked to drink beer and put tobacco in his lip. Dating Andrew made my sexual orientation more digestible. My same-sex experiences were just a novelty. I was their quirky friend who had gone through an eccentric phase that involved crushes on women. Austin ended up living with me for a year. I remember one day nearly jumping out of my skin when I heard what sounded like gunshots coming from outside. It turned out that Austin was firing his rifle into the swamp from our back porch. But he accepted that there was a queer woman in the house and I accepted that we had firearms in the house. As you can imagine, there are guys I work with who simply must hate that I'm in their space. I was once at a George Floyd demonstration in downtown San Diego when pilots from my helicopter squadron started making jokes about the protests in a group text we had. One wrote that he and another pilot would be headed to Walmart around 10 p.m. if anyone needed anything because it would be free, making a joke about looting. Another responded and said, don't worry, I hear tear gas cures COVID-19. I was enraged. I had cartons of milk in my backpack then in case the crowd was tear gassed. I texted back with the fire of my frustration and my fear. One pilot then reminded me not to let the group text become politicized. The other guys gave that message a thumbs up. I was the apparent instigator of the politics, not the idiots who had incited the conversation. I'm assertive, a natural leader, and I'm willing to have difficult conversations. At work, to some of these guys, that means I'm aggressive and bossy, and sometimes I make things awkward. I'm too much. I am taught to them. <laughs> I annoy them in a different way than they annoy me, but we're all annoyed with each other and we also have to work together as a team. We fly missions in formation and I trust them to protect me in the air and they trust me to protect them too. These guys are some of the worst kinds of guys and yet they're serving our country, they're away from their families for months on end, risking their lives so others don't have to, and also they're my coworkers. I have deployed with these guys. I've been forced to move past all the reasons why I don't want to spend any time with them at all in the first place because I have had no choice. I've been trapped on a boat with them for months on end. <laughs> what was I gonna do? And on the ship, we have our meals together, we study together, we work out together, and we have each other's backs. It's not completely miserable. Sometimes I truly enjoy their company, and at a certain point, they stop feeling like coworkers and start feeling like brothers. Terrible, wonderful brothers. I have judged a lot of these guys for their opinions, many of which I believe come from growing up in a bubble. But I was also born in a bubble, then grew up and left home for another bubble. Austin had never left Florida before the Navy, and he had never met a gay person. I had never met people who didn't know gay people. <laughs> Interacting with these bros has helped me gain perspective myself. Andrew is one of those bros and is my best friend in the world. I fell in love with that Todd so hard that I even married him back in 2016. <laughs> wow. We are divorced now. <laughs> but we are still best friends, and he is here tonight. <laughs> anyway, guess who spoke at our wedding? Austin. <laughs>
In his toast, he teased me for knocking on doors before the 2016 election. Despite my efforts, 95% of our county in Florida ended up voting for that spray-tanned apprentice star, na now criminal defendant. Um, <laughs> Austin said in his toast, guess he didn't knock on enough doors. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was, but it was said with love. I love Austin. He's taught me a lot about friendship, family, faith, and how to get a good pinch of tobacco for your lip. <laughs> Thanks to Austin, I can say, not my first rodeo, at a rodeo, because he took me to my first rodeo. <laughs> But more importantly, Austin taught me that sometimes, in a debate, a win does not mean winning the argument. It means having a discussion with civility. And through our conversations, Austin has become an ally of the LGBT community. Yeah. And he himself spent a year dating a girlfriend he met at my wedding, who is now an OBGYN fighting for abortion access in Tennessee. Austin and, I, <laughs> Austin and I have both grown a lot, and we've been great friends since 2015. <laughs> Not all douchebags are made equal. Some should really hardly ever speak, <laughs> sure. But every one of us would benefit from shutting up from time to time and just listening. Because chances are, even the worst Todd is still just a guy. Probably misunderstood, insecure, and compensating for something. But maybe he has something to teach us. Either way, he's one of us. And often, we are stuck with him. As a coworker, a roommate, a neighbor, a family member. Furthermore, if instead of approaching him with anger and disgust, we approached him wanting to learn, then we might learn. We also might surprise him. We might disarm him with our compassionate curiosity. Maybe that opens the door for him to be curious about where we are coming from, instead of just putting us in a box. I am a lieutenant and a helicopter pilot. <laughs> I'm a mission commander, highly trained to drop torpedoes and fire Hellfire missiles. But I'm also a magician. <laughs> and a tree hugger. I grew up in a hippie town and was raised by a poet. I'm divorced, I'm queer, I'm Jewish, and I believe in the collective consciousness. The point is, there's no way to know me until you get to know me. And the same is true for all of us. All Todd's, and even Austin. We all have different perspectives. We all come from our own worlds, a product of our unique bubbles. What's on the surface would sell all of us short. It's easy to write off the jerk offs. It's harder to befriend them, but we make progress as a society when we face them with an open mind. We can start by listening. Best way to do that is to first, respectfully, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Julie Rowland, ladies and gentlemen, Julie.